Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. The Graduate School is happy to be collaborating with the Graduate Student Senate to bring you this question and answer session. Your student representatives have been working hard to ensure that the needs of graduate students are top of mind as it is determined how to reopen UConn. They and we have been collecting questions from many of you, and today your reps will talk to you about what their experience has been on various committees, and we will pose questions to university leaders as, as many as time will allow. So, um, let's see, joining us today are Rebecca Colby, who is the student director on the Yukon Foundation Board of Directors, Justin Fang, who is the graduate student trustee on the Yukon Board of Trustees, uh, Nafis Fuad, who is the Graduate Student Senate President and member on the University Senate Executive Committee, Farah Lejway, the Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, Kent Holsinger, Vice Provost for Graduate Education and the Dean of the Graduate School, Radanka Merrick, Vice President for Research, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Nathan First, Vice President for Enrollment Management, uh, Enrollment Planning and Management, Ray Alexander, Director of International Student and Scholar Services, and I'm Karen Bresciano, Assistant Dean of the Graduate School. So we'd like to begin by, um, our, our Provost has a few words for us. Great, so, so thanks to everyone who put so much time into this. I am new at the university, as, as many of you may know. One of the reasons I wanted to come to UConn was, was the great graduate students that we have here, and I just really appreciate this opportunity. We are also in a really hard time right now. COVID is making so many things uncertain. We also are at a time in the world where we are starting to really question our values and morals and how we treat each other, and facing up to things like anti-Black racism and other, other questions where we really have to ask ourselves, are we approaching things in the right way. And so as we do that, we thought it was very important to have this conversation today to be able to, as much as we can, try to answer some key questions. I think you will, will see that we will have some very clear and real answers today. There will also be some other places where we will very clearly have to say we're still working that out. And I know that that can be challenging, but over the next month, we're really going to be able to get to the point where we can we can start having everything wrapped up. But in, in the interim, we will do everything we can. And most importantly, I have been so impressed with the collaboration of graduate education and, and all the staff that will be here today with our student representatives. It's been a great experience for me to get to know them and to work in this level of collaboration. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Next, we have some words from our graduate student Senate president, Nafis. Thank you, Karen. I'd like to start by sharing how we, the grad student leaders in this panel, conceived of this conversation. This will also explicitly answer a question of confusion that came up. That is why all the grad students in the panel are from STEM. So all three of these positions we are in are elected ones. Regardless of COVID, we uh, deliberate graduate student interest in different capacities in different levels of the administration. All grad students have equal chance to run for these uh, positions and all are welcome. Now we felt obligated to bring forth our effort and experience in these deliberations as well as to facilitate a platform where questions and concerns of grad students during this pandemic are answered. I would also like to use this platform to state that the graduate student leaders have absolutely no tolerance for racial bias. We, along with the USG, are committed to taking tangible action in order to protect our econ nation. So I'll leave it to Karen. Thank you, thank you. Um, my first question actually is for you, Nafis. Um, so what are the grad school, it was a question that was asked, what are the grad school and the university leadership doing to ensure that graduate students are included in the decision making and shared governance in relation to opening decisions and budget cuts? Thanks again. Uh, as grad student representatives, we have been in continuous deliberation in reopening planning. I wanted to make sure uh, to everyone that 
we we are being heard. I serve on the Senate Executive Committee and the Fall 2020 Scenario Planning Work Group. Justin lobbies our interest at the Board of Trustees. Rebecca is a trustee on behalf of all the students at the foundation. And more so, Justin, Rebecca, and I also serve as an advisor to our provost and the dean of students. And GSS has appointed members uh, to several other committees or working groups tasked to plan the reopening. I'd like to say that um, budget cuts is a complex decision that goes through various stages involving various stakeholders. But it, I, I would like to assure you that it includes graduate student representatives when it comes to graduate uh, interest. We invite all graduate students to voice their concerns with us, and we will act upon them to our best capacity. Please uh, check GSS website, how to reach to us. And what I can promise you, I will, uh, we will all make your concerns heard. Thank you. Thank you, Nafis. OK, uh, it's no surprise that the area of most concern to most graduate students and many of the questions that came in are regarding financial matters. So I'd like to jump right into that. Uh, Dean Holsinger, uh, several questions have come in that have interrelated answers. So I'm going to read off several questions at once um, so that you, you can you know, give us um, a coordinated answer. Um, so graduate students are understandably worried about finances. Um, the first question is, why does the dean and the rest of the university leadership insist on individualizing our problems when it is clear we are struggling with a global pandemic, economic rescission, and severe lack of support from our schools and colleges, schools and workplace? Why is it being left to individual departments to determine the response to graduate student needs during this time? What is the plan to highly encourage departments to plan for and find funding for graduate students who might need an extra year or semester to graduate? And then uh, the last question in this piece was about graduate students. Some are not receiving the funding during the summer that they were anticipating. How is this being addressed? Uh, thank you, Karen. I'll, I'll try and answer each of those in turn. With respect to the individualized approach that we have been recommending and discussing um, for graduate student support, that's really driven by two related factors. First, uh, the vast majority of funding available to support graduate students it comes through it in the form of assistantships. And those assistantships are, almost, are, are entirely funded either as research assistantships uh, derived from sponsored projects of various sorts or teaching assistantships within departments. What that means is that the vast majority of the money available to support graduate students is under properly the jurisdiction of either individual uh, faculty members or departments. And so it's really up to them to determine how to expend the funds. Furthermore, it also is the case that there, the conditions vary tremendously from one department to another, and it's, it's not possible for any central administrator, no matter how well-intentioned, to understand the complexities of the more than 180 fields of study that the graduate school represents, and it's far better for the faculty within those programs to make decisions about how best to support graduate students than for any central administrator to do so. With respect to encouraging departments to find funds to support graduate students for an additional year or more, um, I, I may actually ask uh, if we could to have Vice Provost Merrick address this in part after I'm done, because I know one of the important efforts we're making is to find ways by working with external funding agencies to increase funding for research assistance in particular on federal grants. Um, with respect to summer support, I am aware that there have been some delays in summer support because of the caution associated with making appointments under uncertain conditions with respect to COVID. The university is committed to ensuring that any graduate assistant who uh, receives an offer actually has that offer honored as under the contract. And so departments have been a bit cautious in making those appointments to ensure that they're able to follow on through on the commitments that they make. 
Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Merrick, was there anything you wanted to add? Make sure that I unmute myself. So th thank you for, for having me. And uh, the federal agencies extended the no cost extension for three months on all grants. And this is across the board, NIH, NSF, DOE. Uh, what we put as an institution and we lobby with other institutions is to ask for three months extension. We submitted a document on April 27. There are two attempts to submit uh, the documents to our representatives and in Washington, D.C. And we will know decision by end of the June. So it, it's coming very soon. But for now, there is no additional money. It was three months. Uh, no cost extension, and we requested three months cost extension. Okay, thank you. So the next block of questions are um, still regarding finances, and they are focused to our provost. Uh, will the losses incurred by the university due to this pandemic and the plan to reopen at a reduced capacity, housing capacity, affect TA ships? Um, are there is there any chance? for a cut on graduate student salaries to cover something else in the Yukon budget. And the, the third question related was, can we have a commitment from the provost that the number of TA lines will not decrease? Provost? Thank you. So let me begin by saying we can and, and do provide that commitment. We don't know for sure based on the way in which demand for um, student classes and supply of of the class classes we're able to offer will match up. But so far, things look as if we should not have any kind of major disruption in terms of the number of courses. They may some may be online, there may they may be present provided in other ways. But we we feel that that things are progressing as well as we could hope. And while there may be some additional costs that we would need to cover centrally, we understand why you want that commitment. So we are providing that today. So we are able to you know, roughly support the same number of TA ships. I can also say with certainty, um, we, there are no discussions of cutting GA salaries. Now, I will tell you, as a university, we are still having to make some tough decisions about the potential of, of furloughs or other sorts of, of tough cuts in terms of salary and in other areas. I know we haven't made these decisions, but we are talking about um, salary cuts among upper administrators. There are no conversations as this relates to any sort of cuts or furloughs for graduate students. Thank you. Uh, the next question also for the provost is uh, if any contracts, any GA contracts cannot be held due to its particular nature um, on site for face to face, how would the university accommodate that? Yeah, so one of the things that we are saying very clearly, uh, I don't know how much this information gets to everyone. So there, there will be a message from our president in the next day, and then the provost message will follow that to, to essentially discuss and, and clarify that those who want to teach online will be able to do that. Now that is that adds a lot of complication in terms of how we're able to match things up, but that is really crucial to us that we are able to, to say that with clarity, both for faculty and for grad students who are instructors. Now, that, that may mean that when we match up the student demand and the supply of courses, there can be some, some challenges in terms of making that match, but we are committed to finding ways to ensure that if a graduate student is, for whatever reason, whether it's a lab or a cohort, uh, what, if they, what they were expecting to, to be a TA for, if they want to be online or for some other reason they can't, we will find it. We can't necessarily promise exactly what it will be, but we will find a way to honor that. Commitment. Okay. And would that be similar for we're talking for RAs? Well, if they're talking yes. about trying to be in a certain lab. Yes, yeah, same thing. Okay. Okay. 
And um, the, the follow up question on that one from our students was, will this be considered as an accessibility issue? And what about other accessibility issues? So one of the, the things that we are doing in our planning is we have an entire section on diversity, equity and inclusion. And in the context of that, we are including questions about accessibility and ensuring that we have each of those answered. And there's a variety of ways in which that that plays out. We will start sharing that in a website that we'll be putting together for the university. And so without putting a lot of time into that now, I can say that we are thinking about this very deeply. I have met with the cultural centers and with other groups to try to ensure that while our, we have to ensure safety, we have to ensure rigor, we also have to ensure um, equity and inclusivity. Thank you. Okay, the next question is for our GSS president. Will GSS consider directing their events money for things like prom and the cookout that will not happen during social distancing towards funds, not loans for graduate students? Thanks, Karen. I think this needs a bit of clarification. The GSS operates on student fee money, which by law we cannot uh, used to fund any individual or organization. That money can only be used so all grad students have equal chance to benefit from it. That's why we, we fund different events or we have to be very careful how we spend that money. And it's uh, we cannot use it to fund an individual or an organization. Okay. The loan, I, I would like to add a bit to it about the loan fund because it, it, since it was asked, the loan fund is a separate fund from the provost office that GSS is steward, the steward of. While we can't give away that money either, we have extended the due date for that for any loans and any loans that will be taken uh, 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 from now on to uh, till September 1 for COVID. So please check GSS or contact GSS for this uh, matter. We have also asked for authorization from the state comptroller to increase the amount because that is not in our hand. We need authorization from the state comptroller's office. So rest assured, we are doing everything we can from our funds to to help grad students. Thank you. Thank you, Nathis. Okay, Becca, the next question is for you. Um, the Students First Fund has received a lot of attention as a result of the pandemic. Can you tell us what you have learned about this fund in your role as foundation rep? Sure. Thanks, Karen. So far, the Student First Fund has received over $700,000 worth of requests. Um, some have been met by other means of financial aid, and over $60,000 have come from SFF. Um, there's approximately $42,000 left in the fund and an additional $50,000 needed to meet all pending applications. But again, they all are working very closely with the financial aid office to serve and provide um, support to students to the best of their ability. Um, and as for fundraising beyond that, the foundation as a whole has been working really hard to adjust to this new world of fundraising under the restrictions that the, a pandemic imposes. Thank you. And, and, and Becca, just to clarify, there's been um, some folks are under the impression that this is an undergraduate facing fund. Can you just give us a little information about about that? Sure. Um, the fund, I mean, it's a simple answer. The fund is available to undergraduates as well as graduate students. Thank you very much for that clarification. Thank you, Karen. All right. The next several questions seem most appropriate for Vice President First. Um, so can you please share with us, uh, Vice President First, some information about how your offices made decisions about how to set up the distribution of the CARES Act fund? What was put into phase one versus phase two, the decision to require the FAFSA to be considered, and how were graduate students taking into consideration? Absolutely, so happy to do so. And, and as with many things, I think it's easiest to, to work through the chronological order of how things have evolved with regard to emergency support for students. Um, and I'll start with what the university did before CARES Act was even passed by Congress. In late March, the university started through the financial aid office, receiving requests for emergency support from students across all class levels, all career levels, 
um, and began distributing money. And so we actually were awarding out about $100,000 a week of emergency awards to students based on financial hardships as a result of COVID-19. After this, Congress passed the CARES Act. And as you know, CARES Act included a set of funds that was designated for the university to distribute in the form of emergency grants directly to our neediest students. Um, originally, the U.S. Department of Education, which is facilitating in, in, uh, the program, um, issued very little guidance, and we were excited about that because we would have uh, approached things in a far more uh, different way if there was, you know, very little parameters around who could receive the funds. And then um, a couple weeks in, the U.S. Department of Education changed course and said, uh, well, actually, now there are a set of criteria that students must meet, including Title IV eligibility. Um, and a lot of this you can find on the financial aid website, but what Title IV eligibility means is that there's 12 different categories um, that students must meet in order to be Title IV eligible. Some of them are very straightforward, like being a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, um, which does exclude international students and undocumented students, more on that um, in a minute. Um, but others uh, of the criteria include male students must have registered for selective service, uh, among other things. So. University in determining how we wanted to proceed with distribution to our neediest students determined that really the best way for us to proceed uh, with students was to have students submit the FAFSA because the FAFSA actually checks all 12 of those Title IV eligibility requirements. So rather than having individual students have to be requested to submit a number of documentations uh, to us to make sure that they were eligible to receive a CARES Act grant, uh, the student could do uh, the FAFSA, which is not to be taken lightly because it's not an easy form to submit either, but um, that one form then allows the student to be screened for all 12 criteria for Title IV eligibility. And it does things like IRS retrieval when you get in there and do the FAFSA and, and other things that are of convenience to students as they actually uh, go through the process. In terms of our approach, um, we actually use that $100,000 run rate $100,000 a week is what we were uh, uh, distributing in, in the form of institutional aid. So uh, the, the federal government had also wanted us to get the, these monies out there as quickly as possible. Uh, we weren't to sit on them. We weren't to receive the monies from the federal government and just you know, take our time in getting them to our neediest students. So we had to come up with an approach um, to distribute the monies as quickly as we could to our, our neediest students. And so phase one was rather large. It included over 90% of the funds. Um, and uh, we distributed funds uh, to students across all grade levels. Phase one, I, I believe, uh, benefited uh, between 1,200 and 1,500 graduate students in um, about a million and a half uh, dollars uh, for uh, those students um, as a part of phase one. And then phase two, uh, just 6% of the total uh, allotment that we received was determined um, as I said, based on that run rate, we wanted to try and set aside some funds for the students who had not yet submitted a FAFSA. And this then provided an opportunity for students to identify themselves to us and to actually go out and submit the FAFSA and, and go through that process. So we're in phase two um, as it stands now. Um, we are, um, let me just say a word before uh, I go forward um, any further about undocumented students. Um, as you know, the state of Connecticut passed uh, a law a couple years ago allowing the university to award institutional financial aid to students who are undocumented through our institutional aid application for undocumented students. Um, as it turns out, as you know, and I, I just mentioned, Title IV eligibility excludes undocumented students from receiving a CARES Act emergency grant. Um, as an institution, we decided that it was really the right decision for us to uh, use the same methods and criteria for undocumented students that were aid applicants as we did for the FAFSA uh, submissions that we received. So we did that and undocumented students received the same amount of money um, that a student who was uh, a U.S. citizen or, or a permanent resident. Um, not that that addresses international students um, as has been, has been pointed out. Um, so uh, at this point, phase two application, I believe it, it has probably been brought down today because we received a number of applications uh, for support and FAFSAs uh, to distribute the remaining funds. Um, not to say that we won't receive additional monies. We're actually hopeful in, in petitioning the federal government to get us additional funds that we would be able to distribute to students 
Um, but for the amount of requests that we have um, in hand right now, um, we are uh, taking down the form. And turning our attention, um, it's important to note, we have not stopped awarding financial hardship funds to students out of our institutional monies um, that we have available to us. And those, those funds actually have been distributed to international students. Um, so that's an important point for anybody um, who is not a U.S. citizen, who is not undocumented and eligible for the aid application. Um, we have institutional funds that can assist you. Um, but the academic year for the 19-20 year is now over. We're focusing on the, the 2021 academic year. So the requests that we're receiving now are actually for uh, consideration for the upcoming academic year. Um, wherever possible, um, we're enhancing awards or giving uh, monies to students uh, for the upcoming year. Um, that's really the high level uh, overview of it all. Um, of course, there's more and I, and I think other questions, but we'll follow up. Um, I believe with information on the website uh, to fill in any gaps that may exist. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. Um, your, your answer was very comprehensive and went through um, some of the other questions that had come in about uh, DACA of students and international students. Um, what a, there's another question. Um, if so, say if somebody had applied for uh, some funds from CARES Act and they were denied or weren't able to get what they needed, is there a way to appeal that decision? No way to appeal the CARES Act decision, but there is a way for a student to say to us, what about institutional funds? You know, how can you assist me with, with any type of institutional support through the financial aid office? Okay. And students simply need to email financial aid at uconn.edu. Um, okay, thank you for that. Yep. We had a question that came in, go back a little bit um, for Dean Holsinger. There was a, probably you're the most appropriate person to answer. It was, um, how about international graduate students? Can they work from their home country? So I should probably start that and then I may hand it off to Ray Alexander for more details. This is Kent Holsinger. Unfortunately, for a variety of complicated reasons, we're not able to have graduate assistants perform duties from outside the country. Um, and so if you are in a situation where you're outside the country and unable to return, please contact the graduate school and ISSS and we will work with you to determine what options there are. I don't, are there anything else that you would like to add, Ray? Um, sure, I would just say that this wasn't a decision that the university uh, made lightly and that it was done in consultation um, with, uh, you know, legal counsel and looking at best practices followed by other institutions and it's considering risk um, to the student if uh, they were to work uh, in their home country in a capacity that's potentially in violation of local labor laws or tax laws. We don't want to put students at that risk. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could jump back to uh, Vice President first for a moment, a, a question just came in saying, if I will be teaching online, can I ask for a new computer and printer under the CARES Act? Uh, you certainly can submit a request for additional support. Um, it's possible that if you're an aid recipient that we could increase your budget um, for financial aid and at a minimum what that would do was increase your loan eligibility. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's not the situation in, in most cases that we're uh, meeting the entire need of our undergraduate or our graduate um, or other, for that matter, our, our medical or dental students. Um, we don't we don't cover the full cost um, in the vast majority of, of cases as it is. But um, there are some avenues that we can pursue with you through our financial aid office. Um, so reach out to that um, office again, financial aid at uconn.edu. Um, and they can determine to what extent might it be possible for us to assist you. Um, I would just also add that um, it may not be for, for printers, but there are some um, options um, that are available through uh, uh, departments um, uh, that you may want to consider. So um, uh, there were some loaner uh, iPads and other things that were made available through financial aid and ITS um, earlier in the semester. Um, we're considering what options do we need to put on the table for students in the fall in the case that they don't, students may not have access to technology. Uh, so in one way, maybe stay tuned in another way, um, contact your department. 
uh, to see if there are any options available there as well. Thank you. All right, switching gears. Um, there were several questions that came in that relate to international students. So, um, Director Ray Alexander, thank you so much for being here. I know your office is very busy right now. Um, it's probably no surprise that our first question is about the executive order coming from the White House. Uh, what is the university doing in response to the executive order that was issued a few days ago banning students from China? Regarding travel bans, will there be an exception if the bans are not lifted by fall? And can you talk about presidential proclamations and what is coming for OPT and CPT? Sure, so um, there's a lot happening now in terms of visas and immigration, both from a policy perspective and directly related to the pandemic. So I'll address each of those parts separately. Um, first, related to the presidential proclamation, um, I do wanna clarify that, um, that this presidential proclamation issued last week did not impose a ban on students from China, although it certainly sends an unwelcoming message from the US government to all current and incoming Chinese students. The potential impact in the short term is really for the entry of graduate students who have affiliations with institutions that support China's military civil fusion program. However, the order provides no details on how these students will be identified or how the order will be implemented. And so with so little information, it's difficult to assess how new and current Chinese students will actually be, be impacted. Um, so really at this time, we're working with our colleagues and our professional networks to better understand the proclamation. And we are waiting for more information from government agencies who would actually be tasked with implementing the proclamation. And so as soon as ISSS has better knowledge, on how the proclamation, uh, proclamation will be implemented, we'll share that with students uh, and the university community. Um, regarding travel restrictions, uh, the question was whether there'll be exceptions if the bans are not lifted by fall. Uh, we anticipate that travel to the US will be very difficult for most international students this fall. Uh, the US government has not coordinated a plan to ensure international students can arrive or to exempt international students coming to the United States from countries with active entry restrictions. Um, some students who currently reside in countries that are subject to an entry restriction have explored the option of first traveling to a country that is not subject to a restriction for 14 days before traveling to the United States. Um, however, this is not a realistic solution for most students, and we want to remind students that transit flights may actually travel through restricted countries, or as the COVID-19 pandemic moves globally, new restrictions may be placed. Um, finally, uh, talking about uh, presidential proclamations, legal changes in general, and what's coming for OPT, CPT, I would say that universities and international students are very concerned about proposed and announced legal changes that impact international students. And so in addition to the recent proclamation, ISSS is watching a number of other proposed changes. These include legislation introduced that would restrict access to US intellectual property and sensitive technologies, as well as a rule to establish a maximum period of stay for international students. There's also been speculation that F1 student benefits like OPT could be restricted or suspended in the context of COVID-19 and US unemployment. But what's really unclear at this time for all of these is how such actions would be enacted and whether they would be allowed to move forward if introduced. So ISSS is closely watching all of these developments and communicating with our government liaison on these issues. We're also arranging for a student presentation on these developments with an immigration attorney, uh, and we'll announce a date for that soon. Okay, thank you. It's a lot going on. Yeah. Um, the next question um, that had come in previous uh, relates to also a question that just came in now. Um, previously, that was more broad. What steps are being taken by UConn to support the education of international students who can't physically come to the U.S.? Um, and then since we've been here, uh, one of the questions that just came in is, aside from labor law and tax reasons, would the panelists be able to expound on the complicated reasons behind the decision that international GAs cannot work from their home country? Sure. Um, so I think that I'll address the first question. Um, so it is about what steps are being taken by UConn to support the education of international students who can't physically come to the United States. 
Um, right. So it's um, it's my understanding that options for international students who are overseas will vary depending on each student's program and whether remote courses will be available for those students. Uh, ISSS will likely need to counsel each individual student who cannot arrive to assess whether or not we can keep your I-20 or DS 2019 form active during the fall semester. Uh, this will largely depend on your academic enrollment for the fall and guidance from the government on student visas and remote learning for fall semester. Um, Dean Holsinger, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that covers it pretty well. And then again, maybe I'll start with the to explain a few more of the complications about the limitations on work and turn it over to you if you have anything to add. So as Ray said, the primary driving consideration behind the decision was protecting students who are living in countries other than the US. Um, labor and tax laws vary tremendously from country to country, and we don't have the expertise to know in which countries it might be okay to work and in which countries it might not be okay to work. We know there are some countries in which it would be a violation of labor and or tax law. And so students could be at severe legal risk if the, if it were discovered that, that we were hiring them as graduate assistants. In addition, certain countries um, are subject to export control restrictions, meaning that even if it were legally possible to pay someone to do work, that the kind of work that they are able to do might not match the work available because of export control restrictions that restrict the kind of work that can be done internationally. But all of that to, to be said, it was a very difficult re, uh, decision to reach because we are very interested in, in supporting our international students and helping them complete their degrees and really wanted to find a way to make it work, but we're unable to do so. And can, if I can add, uh, regarding the federal uh, government rules and federal agencies like NSF or NIH, many of them have the rules that if the grant is issued to be performed in US, you must be in the US to perform. So it also comes to the compliance rules. Thank you. Um, Ray, the next question um, is for you, um, though you may need to pass it to somebody else. Um, if, the, if departments do not fund international students who might need extra time to graduate due to the pandemic, via GA ships during this time, can or will UConn waive tuition fees for them? Yeah. So I'm going to ask Provost Lejoy to, to address this question, but what I can say is that ISSS will help you to explore whether there are visa options available to meet your financial needs if you need an extension. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, there may be options where you could reduce your tuition costs if you're eligible from a visa perspective to take a reduced course load or to potentially start post-completion OPT. Um, and this really all has to do with where you are in your academic program and would require sort of individual counseling between ISSS and your academic advisor. And I, I don't really have much more to add to that. I, I think what is most important is that, again, and I know this, this can feel hard, but on a on a case by case basis where we are able to first try to limit the costs by by moving around courses and other things where that remains impossible we will try to do everything we can to limit the financial exposure for students we are certainly considering waivers uh, to do that at this time as a blanket is not something that we're able to do but but we are keeping all these things under consideration. And as we meet regularly with, with the graduate student representatives, we will continue to talk about that. We are certainly starting to work on it. Thank you, Provost. Um, we have another question that came in live. Um, and as a reminder to our panelists, when you, when you come to speak, can you make sure to turn on your camera if you choose? Um, I suspect that this will probably be something that um, Vice President first wants to tackle first, and um, then he can decide if he wants to pass it on. The comment, the question is, contacting financial aid and being offered loans will not resolve any of our issues. Grads need the university to take, as President Katsuleas has written, tangible actions that is supported by the university with budget. 
Any response from any of our leaders? Yeah, I think you probably detected the hesitancy of me, even in, in, in me uh, suggesting that. Um, so um, the reality of it is even, even in the past, um, we have not had a large enough financial aid budget outside of coronavirus uh, to go as far as what we would like to be able to go um, in assisting our, our students who have true financial need. Um, and so that hasn't obviously changed with coronavirus other than that it's just gotten a lot harder. Um, so we're in a situation of stretching a limited amount of resources as far as we possibly can. And part of my job is advocating for those resources and just rest assured um, that I have. And um, I have incredible partners, um, some of whom are on the screen here, but some who are not in our finance uh, area, our CFO, Scott Jordan, um, our foundation president, Scott Roberts. All these are individuals that we're actively engaged with to talk about how do we get more support for students during this very difficult time so that we can make things easier for students. So um, we stretch the dollars as far as we can go, um, but there's a finite amount of resources um, and it's hard to avoid the reality of that, uh, but we do do the best that we can. And, and I can I can also take this because uh, that was a joint statement written by the president and me and I actually wrote that line. So I will take responsibility for it. And you know, part of this is, is we are looking at upwards of 50 to $100 million of deficit as a result of COVID-19. We are certainly putting budget towards this. As I mentioned before, we are, we are able to say that we will cover uh, any TA ships that normally would not be funded because of the situation we are on a case by case basis putting as getting as much budget to departments and the college and schools as we can what that line doesn't say though is that we will be able to address every issue be because we simply can't and so we're we're making these sophie's choices of of really hard things and and we are always going to fall short for some individuals, there's no way that there's enough budget to do that. So I know that answer is not satisfying, but we have to try to do what we can to be addressing issues at all levels of the university. We will put as much budget towards this, but, but we will fall short. Thank you. Our next set of questions are, are regarding research. Um, Vice President Merrick, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you can turn your camera on, we'll be ready to go. Um, I'm hoping that you can speak to us about a couple of questions that students had asked. Um, how will UConn support graduate students? Um, oh wait, no, I'm going to go a different order. Sorry. <laughs> um, how are how are the graduate school and the VPR's office helping PhD students to keep their time to degree to what it was before the pandemic? We already reopened research program. We work very closely with HR and graduate school regarding continuing funding for GA. As long as the federal government, as I said, the all agencies agree to go with three months of no cost extension. So we will keep the graduate students on the grant and uh, ask them to telecommute. Uh, currently, we reopen more than 530 labs. So it is up to individual faculties and GA if they can go back to the labs and perform the work. We still encourage people in the case where they can telecommute to do the work by telecommuting. And I will pass to Kent and he can talk more about, you know, what graduate school is doing. Uh, thank you, Rodenka. Yes, and so we've been working very closely with VPR to, to uh, help get the research process going again. Also, we have been providing advice uh, as much as possible on to graduate students on how to do their research in the pandemic. Going back to late March, we issued advice on planning and preparing for research in the, in the epidemic, including if necessary in limited cases, changing the nature of dissertation research to, to some degree. Also keep in mind that even in cases where it's not possible to get the work done in the same amount of time, should students need more time than is provided in the time to degree limits, we've already committed to approving any requests 
to extend time to degree that are supported by uh, major advisors as a, where those requests come as a result of COVID-19. And I can't just build that individual faculties, including myself, decided to use the indirect return to pay the students to make sure that every student is paid because some of the work can not be done at outside of the labs. And I think there will be more faculties and department who are going to explore how much in the saving accounts they have and how they can fund the graduate students. Because I think we all appreciate what graduate students are doing for us as a research institution. Thank you. Um, the next question for Vice President Merrick. Uh, how will you can support graduate students who need access to unique software and books we are normally able to access from our libraries? We had already conversations with the provost office and we are going to further extend those conversation about reopening the labs. So we understand that, you know, there are those needs and, and we are putting going to put the measures in the place for the labs reopening. But Carl, if there is anything that you want to build on based on your conversation with the Dean of Library, please jump in. And I'll just say more generally, when it comes to any services that you've received from the library, they are they are working on both having um, kind of almost like curbside, no contact pickup. They're also now obviously this is, wouldn't be for software, but but where there's a need for articles or other things, they'll be doing scanning, other ways to provide them. If there are specific needs that something you had received from the library before that the things I mentioned didn't cover. I, I know the Dean of the Libraries, Ann Langley, would be very interested in hearing from you about what those needs are. She has everything that we've brought to her. She's risen to the challenge of finding a creative way to provide it. Thank you. Um, also for Vice President Merrick, at least for the beginning, uh, the question from the students are, how can we make sure faculty understand these extraordinary situations with pandemic and racial movements and reach out to their grads, not pressuring them to produce results to make up for lost time? Uh, I think in the number of the gathering, uh, President and myself had been continuously stressing that the safety and well being of our student is number one priority. So we encourage the faculty to give graduate students opportunity when they can work from home to work from home. Uh, any abuse and bad behavior by faculty, we are not going to tolerate and we are going to take actions and suspend research. Uh, there are channels um, and there is confidential report line where concerns and issues by graduate students can be raised. And I will let Ken uh, speak about the steps that graduate school is taking. So to, to follow uh, Vice President Merrick's remarks, the graduate school does have resources available to help you think about problems you're facing. If you're facing pressure from your major advisor or principal investigator to produce results that you think are unreasonable, feel free to reach out to us uh, and we will help you work through those issues and identify ways forward. Also keep in mind, as Vice Provost or Vice President Merrick mentioned, there are confidential resources available. In addition to the report line, the University Ombuds is an incredibly valuable resource to help you think through options that are available and identify what those options are. Importantly, the Ombuds is able to do so in a completely confidential way that protects your identity um, whereas the graduate school may not be able to protect your identity. Okay, thank you. Um, one question that has uh, just come in, will the university provide sanitizer and masks for students with face-to-face -face classes? I can, I can okay, take great. that. Uh, yeah, you. absolutely. There uh, the, are different various teams working on this. This is one of the the absolute certainties. And in fact, this this also fits into what what's called gating considerations. These are the guidelines the state has set for us that we have to make sure that we've accomplished to be able to come back. We are setting higher standards for ourselves, and, and this certainly falls within it. 
in addition to what the university provides, we're also developing with, with some of our experts on campus behavioral health strategies where we can also as individuals take additional responsibility to ensure that we're keeping common areas safe, that uh, folks are abiding by requirements to wear a mask. One thing I'll also mention, for some people it is very hard to wear a mask. This could be for asthma, anxiety. We, we are getting, we are actually already set up through HR Human Resources to help find a face covering that will not be difficult to wear for individuals based on different conditions. We're already doing that for staff and, and we've gotten great results in being able to accomplish that. So between a requirement to, to have masks, social distancing, the way we're setting up classrooms, allowing people to be online if they want to be, the availability of necessary PPE, this will all be outlined in the website that I, I mentioned will be live in the next few days. Okay, thank you. Because there was also a question about um, whether it's more or less equally likely that graduate classes will be held online rather than in class. And I know there's no final answers for that yet. Um, so they should stay tuned. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I think you know, in cases like this, you only have so many degrees of freedom. So that's where your your kind of values and priorities start. And, and our values and priorities are first, we want to accommodate anyone who feels unsafe being in person. And so right there, that's a major piece of what will be offered, when it will be offered. There are also some academic reasons where certain things will be more challenging to offer online, but to the, and this is a question that's for me later, to the extent that we can, and, and as closely as we can match the supply with demand, whether it's in person, whether it's online, or we have about three or four blended courses. These include um, what's called platooning, where you can be online sometimes and in person at other times, other sorts of blending, because we are trying to, to stick with, with those values as the first piece, it will just take a little bit longer. So what I will say is if when the mix is all done, if you as a student or as an instructor, because we have to keep in mind graduate students are maybe unique on campus as being both, we will, we will work with you to ensure that there is not an undue impact on your progression in the courses you're taking. And in some cases that may require pretty significant steps, but we, but we are, we feel we've been working with the Center for Teaching and Learning and undergraduate studies, as well as with graduate studies that we'll be able to, to do that as best as we can. But it, that probably is something we're resolving two to four weeks from now, as opposed to in the next few days. Thank you. Uh, our next section um, was all about academics, um, though in, in the interest of time, I'm going to condense some of those things uh, because I think you've answered many of many of these questions you've answered, at least in part earlier. Um, and there's a couple of other questions that have come in that I think are really timely um, and we have not talked about yet. For example, somebody just asked, are PIs at risk of being furloughed or laid off? I can take that. So, uh, you know, the, we have unions on campus. There are a lot of complications that really ensure that we have to take our time and be thoughtful with this. What I will say is we, we are not looking at layoffs. Furloughs really are essentially a handful of days where someone may not go into work. It is a it is a way to handle a reduction in salary without cutting someone's salary. So if they're not working, you have them not come and work. The last thing, one of one of the president's guiding principles is do no harm to the institution. And you know, doing anything that would undermine our research through layoffs and furloughs, you know, or just 
not something that we want to consider. Now, as I said before, in every domain, we are not able to accomplish as much as we'd want to, but, but certainly we are not cutting our people in a way where, where we're going to make it so that you as grad students are not able to do your research and not able to progress. Okay, thank you. Um, so if I can jump over to um, uh, Dean Holzinger. What efforts are being made to help finishing PhD students with the bad job market? Karen, you cut out a little bit there. I didn't quite get the question. Uh, what are we doing? What are efforts are being made to help finishing PhD students with the bad job market? Uh, what we are doing is what we have been doing for a number of years, which is we work very closely with the Center for Career Development to, to make sure that we, we do everything we can to make sure that graduate students, PhD students in particular, are aware of the wide range of career options available to them and are prepared to per, pursue those options. The, those options are more limited now and it's unavoidable in a global pandemic, and we are simply redoubling those efforts. There isn't anything we can do to create jobs where there are none, but we will do everything we can to support you in your search for a job, along with help from the Center for Career Development. Thank you. Um, can I just add something to that too? I mean, I, I'm, I'm new, I'm basing this on my past experience, but one, one thing that I've really come to understand, when I was a faculty member, I put a lot of pressure on my students to want to be faculty. That was the way I was raised, it was the way I thought about things. We are moving more towards an understanding that for some people that's the right career path, but there are many other career paths and that we want to support you in finding the job that is right for you. I am sure knowing the folks that are here that that is something we are working on here as well, but I just want to say from my perspective, I very much support the idea that grad students should be pursuing a career that is right for them and we should be finding ways to try to support that and move away from kind of this old perspective of if you're not going to end up just like me, that's not okay. Thank you. All right, so we have one minute left, but I wanted to ask this question and, and give Dean Holzinger a chance to respond to it. Um, it's kind of a complicated one. Why is there no leadership coming from the graduate school beyond this one hour panel and Dean Holzinger emailing us a survey? Why hasn't the graduate school worked with graduate student organizers who have one, identified needs, two, identified a plan of action supported by around 500 graduate students? So if I understand the question correctly, I believe it's the, the identified needs in 500 graduate students is referring to the letter that was addressed to President Consoleus, then Interim Provost Elliott and I, a couple of months ago. That letter did lay out a variety of specific actions that the students had identified as being important and necessary. As we outlined in our response, we are committed to doing everything we can to support graduate students. We outlined that some of the requests were things we had already done. Others were things that we were studying and continue to study and work on, like providing support through uh, working with federal agencies to extend financial support. Others are things that are simply beyond our capacity. It is, it is the case that we have listened to and considered all of the things that have been presented to us. Unfortunately, it is also the case that we cannot respond positively to all of them, but we have responded to all that we can respond and will continue to do everything we can to make the graduate student experience at UConn a productive one and to help all of you finish your degrees in a timely fashion. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, not surprisingly, we have run out of time. There are many more worthy questions that have come in, although I actually feel pretty good about the number that we got through. Um, some of these questions we'll be able to put online and answer them um, from our website. Some of them we'll save for the next time that we get together in a format such as this. 
Um, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. Thank you to the students who took time to, to send in questions. Most of all, thank you to the students who are with us right now. We know that we didn't have time to get them all. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank the folks doing the work behind the scenes to make this happen, especially Stuart Duncan, Marie LeBlanc, and Cinnamon Adams. Thank you so much.